Good afternoon to all. A very uh, warm uh, welcome to all of you. Um, I can't see you, but uh, I uh, went through the registration list and uh, very good to see so many uh, familiar uh, names. So uh, very welcome to this EVPA webinar session. Um, my pleasure today to be here with the EVPA team. Um, I'm welcoming uh, Lev, uh, Fechesh, uh, Fechesh uh, Lev. Yes, Lev is our EVPA corporate uh, initiative uh, manager. Um, I'm welcoming also Nicolas, Nicolas Malmandier, corporate uh, initiative associate. Good afternoon, Nicola, and uh, a very warm welcome to our two amazing uh, speakers today uh, who will share our, their impact integrity journey with us. Um, Vincent Faber, Executive Director of Trafigura Foundation. Good afternoon, Vincent, warm welcome. And Asa, Asa Kokstrom Feld, with my best Swedish accent. Uh, ASA is leading uh, IKEA Social Entrepreneurship uh, Initiative. Uh, warm welcome, uh, ASA. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you also, Vincent. So um, today for this uh, next hour, we, we're going to discuss how corporate social investors can safeguard the impact integrity. Um, Thank you, Nicolas. So we're going to start with a, a quick intro. Uh, then uh, Nicolas will present the impact integrity uh, insights of our latest publication. Um, then uh, Lev will moderate uh, the, the session with uh, Vincent and Asa. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, save uh, 10 minutes of uh, Q&A really to take on your questions. Uh, I'm already uh, encouraging you in the course of the webinar gradually to just leave your question in the in in the box uh, in the box with this purpose, um, and we'll add up five minutes with with some closing remarks. Uh, we will do our best. By the way, we will do our best to take uh, some questions uh, before four o'clock, just uh, in case some of you had a hard stop at, at four o'clock. So uh, why this topic? Why EVPA decided to uh, provide their corporate members, their members at large, by the way, um, uh, with this impact integrity uh, topic? Pretty simple. Um, one is the one, Naturally, corporate social investors, by this, you, you know, we, we mean corporate foundation, corporate impact investing fund, they, they sit inside a, a corporate organization. So they are a non-profit sitting in the, into a, a for-profit organization. So there is a, a natural bias uh, from, from the start. Uh, second, we see the corporate social in investors uh, increasingly collaborating with the company, leveraging the asset to generate impact at scale. And uh, we, we love seeing that. We, it's really uh, part of EVPA mantra with the, the corporate members to urge them to do so. Uh, definitely a good practice. But we recognize that at the same time that the company are pushed to be more engaged in the social space. That means that the frontier between the two is blur, more and more blur, and it creates opportunities of generating impact at scale, but obviously it creates as well challenges. So uh, hence some guidance that we, we provided uh, for our members this year and uh, very uh, happy to, to share those uh, during this session. Um, so we will discuss the challenge which arise with regard to impact integrity and also uh, some mitigation actions that they can take to address them. Uh, I mentioned that, uh, of course, we, we had a focus uh, to put this uh, topic into the, the, the corporate, uh, the corporate um, uh, context, but uh, some of those challenges and mitigation actions, of course, are um, 
very valuable also for uh, when we talk about impact integrity outside any corporate uh, context. And I'm thinking about independent impact investing fund or family foundation. I know not all of you participants today, not all of you are from corporate organizations. So um, I'm, I'm sure it, it should be uh, also valuable for you. So, um, just before handing over to Nicola to share the EVPA publication highlights, I'd like to share with you, um, yes, this Slido. Um, uh, we're going to have a Slido for a, a quick poll. Uh, if you put your iPhone, you take your iPhone uh, and with the, the photographic um, the photographic function you access these questions so question number one maybe i wait uh, still uh, a few seconds before we start this first question so what comes to your mind when you hear the terms impact integrity please share with us a word two words max what comes to our mind A good warm up for the discussion. Hmm. Already very interesting concept I can see here. Okay, greenwashing, evidence, measurement struggles, math formulas, firm value, priority setting, materiality, financial materiality, very interesting. Hmm. Yeah, paves the way for very interesting uh, concepts already. Very good. All right. We go for the mm, very good. We only had one question, right, Nico? Exactly, that was the only, only one. Very interesting. So uh, we'll certainly connect the dots between those words and uh, uh, the, the the discussion uh, that we're going to have in a few minutes. Uh, Nico, over to you to share the insights of our publication. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sophie. Yeah, to see the word cloud was already quite interesting because it shows that there are many different uh, concepts associated with impact integrity. And this is also very much what we have seen when we conducted this research. Um, everyone we interviewed was aware of the, the terms impact and integrity themselves, but putting the two together was not something that everyone has already done before. So we were thinking about, okay, what does impact integrity mean? After this re research, we came up with this definition of safeguarding the societal mission from negative external influence. So that means that the social mission of a nonprofit organization re uh, remains stable and is not uh, drifted by any uh, external influence from the direct uh, stakeholder environment. But for corporate social investors, this has different implications because of their uniqueness. As Sophie just described, they are unique in the sense that they are impact driven, but they are related to a for-profit uh, entity. So there's already some basis, some bias, some basis for conflict of interest that need to be taken into account. And also because we see more and more companies um, uh, that take into account that creating impact and create, uh, generating profits is not mutually exclusive anymore. So we see more and more purpose statements in which the uh, companies state that they would like to address social and environmental issues while at the same time generating profits. And this is the blurring of the lines uh, Sophie just mentioned. So this means that we need to look at different relationships a uh, corporate social investor has. We're looking at the relationship with the related company, and also the relationship with the key stakeholder environment, which can be the media, social sector, 
for uh, regulators. And for each, in order to safeguard impact integrity, then uh, the corporate social investor needs to do something at both sides of the relationship. So with regards to the related company, it's important to safeguard the societal mission. With regards to the key stakeholder environment, it is important to signal legitimacy. And in order to do that, the corporate social investor needs to manage corporate influence and needs to manage perception. And I would like to highlight here that the focus is very much on the relationship with the related company, because this is also where this, um, the, the unique implications with regards to impact integrity come from. The skepticism, uh, skepticism that comes from the key stakeholder environment is a result from this relationship. So for a corporate social investor, there are three uh, steps that need to be taken in order to effectively uh, safeguard impact integrity. The first one is to get an understanding of uh, the actual impact integrity risk, so assessing the risk of impact integrity, then to identify the sources of the, the challenges that a corporate social investor is facing, and then the third step is to apply the appropriate mitigation actions to address exactly these challenges. So let's have a look first at the first step, um, assessing the impact integrity risk. At EVPA, we look at two different factors that um, significantly influence the impact integrity risk. The first one is the dependence on the related company. We define dependence um, along the lines of governance, so the board composition, the investment decision, who is involved in this investment decision and how um, does it take place, the staffing, is it staff from, uh, uh, with a background from the related company or is it staff that was externally hired? Also at operations such as uh, communication, is the corporate social investor using its own communication channels or is it using the ones of the company that very much uh, has an influence on, on the dependence? And then of course, the funding. Is the funding only coming from the related company and if, if so, what is the model they apply? Or is the, the corporate social investor also getting uh, funding outside of the company, such, a, such as a diversified funding model? So these are things we need, we need to take into account when we look at the dependence of a corporate social investor. Then we also look at the strategic alignment. So how does the corporate social investor strategically align with the related company? And around two years ago, EVPA came up with a framework with four types of alignment. Uh, I won't go in depth because for the sake of time, uh, for the sake of time, I will just say that non-material alignment means that the alignment is quite loose, that the uh, corporate social investor is rather at arm's length. Uh, and business alignment is very much closer to the core of what the business would like to achieve. So, this is what we want to represent on the horizontal axis. And putting together dependence and alignment gives us the impact integrity matrix. On this matrix, we have four quadrants, the low risk quadrant, uh, two medium risk quadrants, and the high risk quadrant. And depending on where this corporate social investor is positioned on this matrix, it's an indication of how much risk this uh, corporate social investor might perceive uh, with regards to impact integrity. Of course, this also depends on, on external factors on the specific context of the CSI, but this is already an indication of, uh, of what happens if uh, dependence increases and alignment increases. And at that point, I also would like to note that risk is not necessarily something negative. It is something that can be managed, and there are there might be good reasons for a corporate social investor to be positioned rather in the high risk uh, corner because this is something that is part of the impact ambition uh, the corporate social investor has. Stronger dependence can mean that uh, the access to corporate resources 
is facilitated. But this is something we will um, hear more about later with the practical examples. Then the second step that needs to be taken to safeguard impact integrity is identifying the challenges. And there are specific challenges that arise from each of these relationships. So again, we're looking first at the relationship with the related company, and we identified a set of sub-challenges that uh, build up to a broader main challenge, which is in this case, managing the corporate influence. Again, corporate influence can be very positive, of course, but in the context of impact integrity, it is important to make sure that this corporate influence does not at uh, some point or to some extent create a mission drift. This is very important with regards to this relationship. And of course, there are also some mitigation actions that can be implemented in order to address these challenges. And on this slide, uh, we put, put these mitigation actions uh, in an order that shows that the lowest one requires the least effort, whereas the highest one, the most drastic one, requires uh, more effort than the others. And again, here, very important to keep in mind that the unique potential of corporate social investors is this access to corporate resources, corporate expertise which can then help to create better social impact. If a corporate social investor goes for a mitigation action that will distance uh, the CSI from the company, then this might mean that the co uh, corporate social investor is not able anymore to benefit from this uh, relationship. So it is very important to carefully think about what mitigation action makes sense in the context of corporate social investor. Then looking at the relationship with the key stakeholder environment, again, some uh, specific sub-challenges that build up to a main challenge, which is here signaling leg legitimacy. And I think the word cloud earlier has shown that this is very important. The biggest uh, word in this cloud was greenwashing. So it shows the, the main challenge is is justified, it is uh, sig signaling legitimacy, showing that indeed no business considerations are taken into account in the decision making of the corporate social investor. And then again, we have a number of mitigation actions from low effort to the highest effort, which is here building transparency with key stakeholders. That means, on the one hand, providing evidence for the claimed impact that the, that the CSI has but also disclosing procedures to show that indeed there are no, um, there is no way that corporate bodies can somehow drift the mission again. Um, yeah, so to wrap up, it is very important to have a look at both relationships. Uh, I'm sorry, move forward. It is important to have a look at both relationships in order to manage the corporate influence, but also signal legitimacy. Uh, and it is important to take into account that there are also sub-challenges that might be stronger in certain contexts than others. And to address these challenges, uh, a corporate social investor can either apply some mitigation actions, the ones uh, you've seen on the previous slide, or try to change the position on the impact and integrity matrix which means changing the degree of dependence or the degree of alignment. However, this can be very difficult because it's not uh, always up to the corporate social investor to in decide where it will position itself on the matrix. I think that was um, might have been very theoretical, very conceptual, but I hope, still hope that this is a framework that will help you when you're talking about impact integrity. And I will now hand over to Lev, who will moderate the panel discussion, where we will hear what this actually looks like in practice. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola, for this overview of our study. Um, I hope that, uh, you know, as Nicola was saying, this theoretical framework, which might seem a little bit tedious and boring, it provided the necessary context for us to get into more uh, interesting discussions. 
but before we do that, I would like to turn to our audience. And um, um, as we have heard from Nicola, CSIs have unique opportunities and challenges and uh, due to the relationship with the related company. And at this point, I would like to ask our audience, uh, what are the risks that you think come from this highly beneficial uh, relationship, but the one that comes with risk as well? So what do you think the risks are? And unfortunately, the link to the poll is not available through uh, our system here. So you're going to actually have to scan uh, the QR code to answer this question. Nicola, I don't think I had a chance to scan the QR code. If you could move back a second. The QR code should be on the screen, right? Yeah. We are actually in our way. Reputational. You can start. Can we get some more? Oh, we have come for a circle. Mission drift, obviously, yes, impact drift. So it is, yeah, it's multiplying. Impact washing, impact drift, yes. It looks like uh, our presentation kind of is along the lines of the thinking of our audience. So yes, um, the risk is greenwashing and uh, the risk, what we would like to call it actually to impact integrity. That's one of the risks we have. Thank you, Nicola. So with that, um, I would like to thank you all for your relevant contributions from the audience. And uh, I would like to move on to the most interesting part of this webinar, the case studies. If almost all that you have heard until now, uh, you can read in our publications and articles, uh, the next half hour is dedicated to real life examples. Uh, some practical aspects that will bring our theoretical framework to life. In this presentation, we have focused on how we identify risk, uh, but that's only the first step in the process. The impact integrity matrix is an objective assessment which is based on a few questions related to the variables that Nicola has already presented to you uh, that relate to dependence or strategic alignment. Uh, but it's a tool that is uh, first and foremost meant to raise awareness and to guide practitioners in the impact integrity safeguarding journey. It's just the first step. This process allows CSIs to identify the challenges and where those challenges are coming from. Uh, the result of this process should allow CSIs to also choose from a range of mitigation actions, the one or the ones, obviously it can be a combination, that best fit their situation and need. Speaking of mitigation actions, uh, dear Reza and Vincent, um, I would like to first thank you for agreeing to share your experience with us and our audience. But before we get into details regarding the positioning of the Figura Foundation on IKEA social entrepreneurship on the impact integrity matrix and what that positioning uh, precisely means in terms of challenges and mitigation actions, I would like to ask you for those that are not familiar with your work or are less familiar with your work, uh, please present in a nutshell what is it that you do and what is the company's role in your social mission. So, as a Please, would you care to go first? Thank you very much. Nice to be here today. So I'm leading IKEA Social Entrepreneurship BB, which is our impact investment arm uh, to support social entrepreneurs and social businesses to scale their impact. And we do that through development programs, accelerators. And we can also work with loans and uh, equity investments. And there is a whole logic behind why it's set up like this. And I assume that's why this part of IKEA is here and not the IKEA Foundation, which is more traditionally set up and at an arm's length dis distance from the business. So some 10 years ago, we saw that social entrepreneurship was an interesting movement for 
everyone to learn about uh, how to work with social challenges in the intersection between philanthropy and business. And we uh, saw that uh, by doing business with social entrepreneurs, we lacked some tools that we wanted to use to be able to scale the impact together and to learn together through co-worker engagement, for instance. And we couldn't use the IKEA Foundation work because that is definitely uh, far away from the business. Uh, uh, so we realized that the best possible way to set it up in the regulation climate uh, of the Netherlands where we are incorporated would be to start a daughter company to our franchisor company and uh, put in the charter uh, the mission and the philanthropic purpose. So very technical uh, background, but of course aligned with what it is that we all see are the challenges in the world. So IKEA was founded by Ingvar Kramprad. He had a very visionary idea from the beginning, creating a better life, uh, a better everyday life for the many people. And as we develop our business direction, we see that we want to keep being affordable, accessible, but also being positive for people, society, and the planet. And that requires uh, new ways of working, social innovation, and there we need to work in partnership across. And social entrepreneurs is one type of partnerships where we can learn a lot. So uh, that was the ba basics for why we are here. Oh, thank you very much. That explains a lot. Uh, turning now to Vincent, could you please do the same in a very short uh, session so that we can move on to more interesting questions. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I'll try to keep it short. So um, um, I'm so I'm the CEO of the Trafigura Foundation. Uh, to take uh, as our words, we are this in this category of traditional grant makers, corporate foundations, except that we are not at at bay or very far away from the business. And I will explain why and why we have kind of undertaken this journey. In a nutshell, what we are doing is about you know sustainable livelihoods. Uh, access to work, access to employment for vulnerable and uh, ostracized communities, access to energy, between brackets, clean energy nowadays, of course, agricultural and rural development, working with small um, small uh, farm holders, um, working on resilience to climate, climate change, uh, especially for coastal communities, access to carbon finance for, again, remote and vulnerable communities. That's the one, let's say, one of our first um, strategic um, direction of work. The second one being uh, responsible supply chains. So that's working about social working conditions, labor, uh, employment, and so forth in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the shipping sector. Because as you know, Trafigura, as a commodity trader, uses a lot of ships and, and crews, working on small artisanal mining communities, and um, working also on decarbonization of the, in the freight sector. Um, we'll come perhaps later on in the conversation on how our relation, we are working in an area that is close to the, to the activity of the business, but we are working really from a general perspective because actually we are bound by law as a foundation of public interest to work in the interest of the public and not in the interest of the, of the of the business and that's where we will come to this to this topic uh, uh, later on it's important to uh, explain because i saw very with a lot of uh, of interest and curiosity that indeed the first words that popped up in the polls that were uh, shown were indeed about greenwashing and, and and not necessarily the risk is is pretty high so there are ways of preventing that risk Coming just um, uh, to conclude this part on impact integrity, what is impact integrity for us? How would we define it? It, it is definitely about remaining faithful to your mission. We were mentioning mission drift. You know if you drift, if you know what your mission is. So you have to have a clear idea what your mission is so that you indeed manage the drift from that mission. Otherwise, you don't know what you're drifting, drifting away from. So you have to be very clear on what your mission is. And for us, the mission is to serve at the best of our capacity, the interest of the beneficiaries that we want to serve through our grantees. Of 
forgot to mention, but we are a grant maker. We don't have operations of our own. Um, and because we are, we were built, and our mission and purpose was to bring change. To bring change, you have to be, um, you have to have impact, and you have to maximize your impact. And maximizing your impact gives you a moral imperative, which is to use at the best uh, of your capacity the, um, the resources that are available. And being a corporate foundation, you have not only money at hand, you also have a lot of expertise, knowledge, networks, competences, skills. And it would be honestly a waste not to tap into this. And it would not only be a waste, but it could be contrary to what your mission is to serve the beneficiaries at the best of your capacity. So you have to make full use of those additional resources, which are just beyond money that you have at hand from um, through your through your parent company. So for me, that's what uh, impact integrity is mostly about. Yes, thank you, Vincent. Yeah, the, as you described it very well, is we placed on the report a person who is walking a tightrope. And sometimes it might feel like that. On one hand side, you have the wealth of um, non-financial resources that you can tap into. On the other hand, you have to be faithful to your mission and you have to be true to your nature. So it's always like walking a tightrope between maximizing the non-financial resources and the resources that the relationship with the related company put at the fingertips of corporate social investors but at the same times you have to manage the influence that comes with it and also it's all wrapped within the uh, larger environment where, which is already looking with skepticism on this uh, relationship in uh, some ways well thank you very much and i think we can move on to uh, uh, more interesting questions, but before we do that, uh, I would like Nicola. Uh, I would like to ask Nicola to share a slide with your positioning on the impact integrity matrix, and ask him to briefly explain why you are placed there and what does it actually mean, uh, mostly for our audience, and uh, that would give us a little bit more uh, platform for our next question. Yes. So. Um, of course, we want this matrix also to have some practical relevance. So now you can see an example of what this looks like if we look at IKEA Social Entrepreneurship and Trafigura Foundation on this matrix. Um, we can see that uh, in terms of dependence, there is um, a difference. So Trafigura Foundation has a relatively low dependence uh, on the company, which is also because um, there are ex external uh, trustees in the board that, are, that have no, uh, no background from the related company. Also, the staff is hired externally because of the competences that are needed in a foundation, which again uh, also reduces the dependence on the company. If we look at IKEA social entrepreneurship, there is a slight uh, closer alignment towards uh, company. It's between thematic and business alignment. Also, the the dependence is higher. The dependence uh, factors are higher because there seems to be also more uh, touch points between what IKEA social entrepreneurship is doing and what the company companies are doing. So, also will uh, be able to tell us more about that. And of course, before I forget, there's also a, a better overview of the different factors. All right, you can also read all about these in our upcoming case files and uh, longer reads. Uh, so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on that. But thank you, Nicola, for presenting that. So um, if we look at the matrix, um, Vincent, where do you perceive your challenges are coming from? Uh, the challenges to impact integrity. And when we look at the relationship with the related company, where do they come from? And if you could give us a practical example and why does that happen? How does this happen? Yeah. So just perhaps because I mentioned it kind of implicitly a little bit earlier on that we, we, we went through a journey over there. We were founded in 2008, so we're kind of entering our 15th year. 
And we started really as one of these traditional, very far away uh, compared to the business foundation working on you know, issues that were totally disconnected to the business um, in this non-material uh, alignment. And to be honest, that was rather comfortable. That's rather easy to operate in that, in that sector. But then in the end, because of that moral imperative that I felt we had as a grant maker and as a foundation, a philanthropist, to maximize our impact by making the best use of our resources, we had to go to get closer to the to the industry of traffic art, not the, not the business agenda, not the commercial agenda, but the industry, because there we could indeed access to a number of expertise and non-monetary resources that would help us maximize our impact. So we moved closer. That was, let's say, um, something like five, six, seven years ago. So of course, as we move closer to the um, to the industry and the sector in which traffic art operates. Then, um, then, then you get closer to the business, and, th and then the risks increase, and you have to be very clear-sighted on, on on what those risks are. So, just give me, uh, let me give you a, a, a couple of um, a couple of examples. When you get close to the industry, I mean, you, the closeness can be either geographic, either thematic. So, for instance, geographically speaking, we have been working. I mentioned it in my introduction with small um, artisanal mining communities. And as most people, I don't know if they know or not, but anyway, trade uh, traffic uh, does work with, uh, with uh, in the mining sector and is an off taker in some of those communities. So at some point you may have kind of conflict, interest conflict. Um, as a philanthropist, you work on communities that are working in the end to supply um, the, the supply chain, if I can say so, um, of, of, of Trafigura. So you have to be very clearly, very clear on what are the respective limits of the foundation versus the company and versus the CSR of the company. And we'll come to this later because this distinction between CSR and corporate philanthropy, philanthropy is for me a, a, an essential driver in, in this uh, impact and integrity reflection. So we had really to kind of define clearly what was the area of the foundation and what was, let's say, um, the area in which the business interest prevailed and where we had as a foundation to really be to stay away from because otherwise you would have blurring conflict of interest. So we defined that concept of inside the fence, which was inside the fence in the sense in the fence of the business where the business interest prevailed and outside the fence where indeed what prevailed was the interest of the communities we wanted to serve. So we had really a thorough uh, conversation with our colleagues from the company uh, and with ourselves to really clearly define that, that limit. The other, um, the other area where, where, where there is closeness that you have to manage is, uh, for instance, on the de decarbonization in the freight sector, because are we working on we are working on corporate practices in the end, and those corporate practices can be those of traffic era, but we are working in the general it's in the general uh, frame of public interest. So when we started engaging with a, a Dutch NGO called Smart Freight Center on decarbonization in the freight sector, at least capturing, measuring, and then trying to reduce um, carbon emissions in the freight sector, we were wondering whether we should be doing this as a philanthropist or whether it should be a corporate action, because in the end, it's the corporate uh, that is that has that ultimate responsibility to reduce emissions in the freight sector. But we thought that because we were very much at the outset of that conversation and of that research, it was a little bit like a lab, and we were working for the industry at large. And that's where we thought that indeed it was good for us to engage there, uh, even if in the end it was about corporate practices, but it was for corporate practice, best practices in the whole world of the industry. So we there worked really as kind of a prototyping a system, making sure that it works, that it made sense, with the view to indeed kind of embed it in corporate practices uh, at a later stage. And at that point, then we handed over the project and the partnership to our uh, corporate friends, because then it was not the remit of the foundation anymore. So I hope these are kind of, um, good examples that can explain what the limits are between both remits and where does the transfer uh, happen or needs to happen from let's say a philanthropic perspective to a corporate uh, perspective yes thank you that very well describes it and it's it's also it's a good example of how difficult things can get 
it's not as clean as the framework. It, uh, it doesn't, you don't know where it ends, where it, where it begins, but it, what makes sense. And if you hit, keep your mission and your, you know that your conscious choices come with risks and you're aware of those risks, you can manage them and you can uh, take uh, appropriate actions. Uh, and I would like to turn now to Asa. Uh, the same question, please, and an example, if possible. Sure, thank you. So I would maybe start by saying that we don't see ourselves as an CSI, that's not how, how we look at ourselves. We look at ourselves more as a competence center and a social innovation hub that can use philanthropic funds to both drive impact and to test pilots within how can we together in the world address different social challenges. And I do think going forward that companies uh, need of course to have a clear materiality of, of their impact and also clear sustainability strategy in how to mitigate the business both uh, environmentally and socially and that innovation normally uh, gets a freer space if it's not done inside the business so positioning in this outside but uh, collaborating with the social entrepreneurs and the co-workers at the same time and also other stakeholders to be honest uh, we do believe that we can uh, find interesting scalable solutions that can scale both outside and maybe even taken into different as vincent was uh, talking of certifications or other standards or even regulations and also business practices because the world will not be uh, as clear as uh, impact investors and companies. It's going to be uh, the same. So I think this intersection between philanthropy and business is really interesting if you want to drive change and want to transform things. And maybe one um, example, we have exactly the same, by the way, as Vincent explained with when it comes to business relationship, be it procurement of products or of services or anything that is handed over to the IKEA company that manages that uh, relationship. So we have a very similar divide of responsibility uh, when it comes to that part. But for instance, IKEA wants to become circular by 2030 and work with uh, uh, renewable materials or recycled materials. We know that recycling is a, a very challenging area in some parts of the world, for instance, in some parts of Asia, where we have a lot of vulnerable people in the value chain. And we, as well as Vincent described, we are also focused on people that are far away from a sustainable income and living in uh, tough circumstances, be it waste pickers, smallholder farmers, or migrant workers or refugees, for instance. So if the company would look into a challenge the the uh, way of working is very siloed into specific types of material but if you go all the way back to the waste management waste goes horizontally so for us it's a benefit that we are not coupled uh, to the company in that sense that we have a philanthropic purpose because we can do more uh, sector oriented or more transformer or transformation oriented investment in social entrepreneurial setups where we believe we can find interesting ways to uh, work with uh, improving the conditions for instance for the waste pickers so I would say for us is that a real advantage that we can do it in that setup thank you um that is you know for me every single time i listen to a case study and i have the occasion to uh, to uh, talk to practitioners outside you know the research context it always amazes me so like there's so many similarities that yeah, they, they, they diverge the, the the wealth of different situations and how you can handle along the same lines different challenges for me is always fascinating and if we talk about how you handle challenges, uh, I would like to uh, go to my next question, if you allow me. Um, the strategies and mitigation actions. 
I would like to take a look at what you have used to safeguard your impact integrity, uh, to walk that fine line that we were talking about, and uh, to take the most out of the relationship with your related company to maximize impact while maintaining your social mission. And uh, when you answer this question, uh, I would also put, uh, kindly ask you to give me again a concrete example of how you have done that. Asa, could you, could you care to go first? Thank you. Sure. So, uh, first of all, we have a separate governance, although uh, those people that are uh, in our board and in our program committee are from the IKEA ecosystem, it's anyhow a separate governance stream, uh, which is, of course, the first step uh, to be able to manage um, our mission. And secondly, we have a very clear theory of change. Uh, for our um, total uh, BV mission, but also for each and every one of our partnerships together with NGOs that support social entrepreneurs, for instance, or even if we do impact investment directly in a social entrepreneur. We are very clear on why is it that we want to do this activity together, and we do a lot of co-creation uh, uh, on the theory of change in the beginning together with all our partners to make sure that we also are uh, looking at the as is situation in the same way and also finding the pathways uh, and the activities where we believe the right outcomes will lead to the impact that we all would like to create or contribute to. So I think that is uh, also a very important one. And then of course, to be clear, uh, have a monitoring and evaluation framework and follow up. And also we are very transparent with our learnings. Uh, what works, what didn't work, where can things improve, uh, both uh, in our network and internally and externally. So uh, those three things uh, is, are the key uh, ways we work with keeping keeping to our mission. So basically we would work to translate then, you know, clarity, honesty, and measurement. Thank you. Vincent, same question, please. Yeah. Um, first, I, I, I should have told you earlier, but congratulations for the research and the study and the report that you have just published, which I find actually absolutely enlightening very good and enlightening and it has just one disadvantage which is as always the theory is always very clear but in practice it's always much more complicated than that and you know there are gray zones and there, there are risks to manage and, 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 um, and potential confusions but at least the report has the merit of clearly putting the landscape out there putting the limits and the the various dimensions of the aspect uh, out there which helps indeed e everyone to understand well where he or she is positioned with it with um, the organization now walking that fine line i will take a bit the same image as earlier on to walk that fine line you have to be uh, very um, well aware where the, where the line is uh, it's a bit like mission drift you can only measure the drift if you know where your mission is so on that fine line you have to be a, to have a clear view to define it as well as possible what that line is and where that frontier is because it is somewhere there is a limit even if we work hand in hand on some issues there is a clear there's a little bit of a gray zone but there is a clear inside and outside a bit like inside and outside the fence as i mentioned earlier so you always have to analyze your activities and your decisions in the light of what your mission and purpose is as a corporate foundation and as a foundation full stop you always have to have this in your mind so that you know that you have no other agenda and that you are not serving another purpose. Um, Decision-making processes, of course, are must be made in full independence. And to be made in full independence, that means that you have to breed a culture of independence within your own trustees, within your own board. You have to have a clear independent mindset and independence full stop uh, at your board level because you have to warrant this to be sure that your decision making is made on the good premises. 
um, the, the, the whole thing of, and as we move closer in this strategic alignment while keeping our independence, actually the challenge is, and that I think encapsulates this fine line you mentioned, is being independent yet connected. And that's a rather subtle and complicated, it's almost an oxymoron um, that you have to manage, and that's a little bit uh, complicated. You can also turn it around saying being connected yet independent. Um, but um, to, to, to be able to make the right decisions in that frame and in, 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 in that very risky kind of, uh, of zone, you have, to have the, you have to really breed this sense of independence at your board level. And also, and that will be my last point, you have to work in close relationship with your CSR colleagues and with your corporate colleagues because it's through the dialogue, it's through the mutual understanding, it's through the transparency of actions that you can really clearly see where the respective remits and the respective domains are. Sometimes people say, well, you better keep away from it, but then that's where the risk starts because then the other part, the other party does not really understand what you're doing. Um, so you have to have this constant dialogue with your corporate colleagues and you have to constantly kind of re-engrave those, um, those, those roles and those processes uh, in the light of your respective and mutual um, uh, purposes. Because it's through that dialogue and through a, an open conversation that indeed you can make sure that we each stay in the remit that is what is yours and what is theirs basically that's through the dialogue that you can have this kind of clear perception thank you very much Wansan. um I, I would like to thank you i think you know the practitioners actually helped us to do this research it's we have not invented anything we have just given it a shape it's uh all this information came out from interviews with practitioners and we just organized it so uh, we're trying to learn as much from practice as possible and shape future practice as possible and make it easier for uh, practitioners to address issues that uh, they find during their regular work. Uh, I'm really glad that you've mentioned one essential thing and I think that has not been talked enough today about it. That it is a process. We said that it's a journey, but it's a it's a constant process. It's not something that you do. It's not some uh, once. It's not something that you saw. It is something that you continuously revisit. And hopefully, our framework is a tool that practitioners can use and make their life easier in that sense. Um, now, I would like to thank you both for the wonderful insights. And uh, I would like to remind our audience that you can ask questions via the chat function. And I haven't seen any questions, Nikolaki. Please help me out if you've uh, received any questions at this point. Not yet. So please feel free to uh, send the questions in the chat. And uh, Lev will then, you should be able to see them. Mm. I can't believe that we have been that we have been that clear that there are no questions. <laughs> no, it, it might have been that we have totally confused everybody because this, yeah, as you've mentioned, this is not an easy topic. So yeah, we are trying to you know cut this topic up into tiny little pieces and have the report, have the case files, have the longer reads and uh, bring in practitioners such as yourselves to illustrate and maybe resonate with uh, with mm -hmm. practitioners more yes sophie please yes in uh while our participants uh type a question in in a couple of in the coming minutes i, I have a question for um you vincent and as a have your company, uh, and I'm thinking typically of the sustainability team, ever asked you to go into uh, a project where you think, no, it's not the role of my team to do so? Um, you, you mentioned the, 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 the shipping industry type of experimentation. Uh, Vincent, and you, you perfectly explain why uh, it was it was at the very start, uh, at the very uh, experimentation uh, step that you could, uh, yes, you were legitimate to, to, to test a couple of things in that direction, but any, any other example where you said, no, I'm sorry, this is offsetting the business, this is not my role, 
and similar to you as a in the supply chain i can Im very easily imagine that you were invited to 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 cross the line and to to go beyond the fence yeah 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 it's a good question and um, I'll try to make it as short as possible, not to go into too many technical details. But we worked for many years, and still are actually, in Africa, along logistical corridors. That, that's the trekking route, route between, let's say, the mines in Zambia towards Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, where indeed then the, 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 the metals and what has been mined is being um, onboarded on, on a very variety of ships. That is a rural road that is taken by so many truck drivers, um, uh, I'm not talking of traffic or tra truck drivers, but just transportation in general and freight. Now, of course, truck drivers, as some of you are, may know, are a main um, factor of the, the spread of diseases, and especially a sexual, uh, sexually transmitted disease for the reasons I don't need to be explicit about. So there is a whole, um, you know, kind of specific healthcare system that has been designed along those logistical corridors by an organization called North Star Alliance that is specialized in healthcare for mobile communities. And in that example, of course, along those roads, I mean, you're providing a service for a, a free service to not only the truck drivers, which are not necessarily, you know, fancy truck drivers from multinationals, but really local drivers, and also to the communities, just thinking of the sex workers, for instance, that that, that, that aggregate along those routes for the reasons you, you may understand. Um, so, so it's providing free healthcare to these communities and to that specific mobile community. The question was, there was also drivers from Trafigura along that road, and Trafigura saw there, well, that's wonderful, let's have, health checks for our staff and the people that are commissioned, the drivers that are commissioned by Trafigura. And I said, well, listen, this can't work this way because this is really about serving communities in need and communities that do not have the resources to afford healthcare. Trafigura have, has the resources to afford healthcare for its drivers or the drivers they charter. So I said, no way that Trafigura can, um, can you know, enjoy those free services. I said, then we have to put a system in place where indeed both communities, both uh, beneficiaries, categories of beneficiaries were kind of split, those that come from a corporate background and that can afford those um, those services and the others that cannot afford the services. So we had to, again, this was a bit of a inside the fence, outside the fence, in a bit of a virtual way, um, in a virtual manner, but we had to separate the services that were, were provided in that respect, because then otherwise there was a confusion or there was an abuse, not necessarily um, an evil abuse, but a uh, temptation to abuse an easy system uh, for free, which I thought was not the right thing to do. Hmm. Very interesting. Is there anything you want to comment on the on the supply chain? Yeah, I cannot uh, think about any examples because in the beginning it was difficult. What can we do and not do, and what should be under the business uh, responsibility and compliance, and what is extra uh, investment in the vulnerable communities? So we, in the beginning, uh, worked out. The, pretty detailed fence about that so i wouldn't say that we have experienced something like that and maybe we have also not been operating as long as you have um but i would like to turn it around because it's very interesting that we are all invited to contribute to the development of uh, our sustainability strategy based on our learning so i think that is where we can uh, take some of the innovation learnings that we have done and really uh, put it into some business ambitions and directions. So I, I found that really interesting and that has happened recently. Hmm. Thank you. Great, thank you. There are questions coming in, excuse me, Sophie. So uh, from Anne Holm, Renady, uh, to all practitioners, uh, what is your greatest lesson learned from navigating the careful balance of benefiting from the corporate know-how plus the networks and staying true to your own TOC and mission? Shall I go? Greatest lesson. <laughs> yeah, we just, yeah, just jump in. Yeah. I think the greatest lesson is to... I mean, for us, 
its social impact for people who are vulnerable and marginalized and to stay true to that does also uh, mean that you need to make sure that the people you're working for are for are also at the table because when you want to do big change you tend to work through uh, maybe you work through NGOs that work through social entrepreneurs and then the people that are affected are very far away uh, and not to forget to bring their voices to the table uh, and uh, make sure that they are included in the solutions for the future. Yeah, if I may. Um, um, yeah, that's a very interesting point, Aza, and I, I, I buy into it as well. I would say that, that my main, um, in that process, that my main um, um, learning point was how to defer, you know, when I started this foundation uh, 15 years ago, I, I started it a bit, a bit candidly. And that sometimes sometimes people would come to me and say, ah, so you're the CSR of the company. I said, well, no, not really, actually. I'm not the CSR of the company. So for me, the main lesson in that journey was to understand what CSR was versus corporate philanthropy. It's not the same thing. Um, and it's not about judging one is right and one is wrong. Both are perfectly right, provided they are done uh, under the right assumptions and the right um, hypotheses. Um, but at least I had to kind of categorize and understand better what made a difference between both. And for me, the difference is rather easy, although it's not academic. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't think it's written anywhere. But for me, corporate philanthropy has to remain driven by the interest of the beneficiaries that we want to serve. Whereas corporate social responsibility is a good thing to do, but it is driven, in fact, um, by also the, the the interest of the business. It's about uh, securing a license to operate. It's uh, about um, mitigating the uh, impact you may have uh, in the field for communities in the vicinity of your assets or your, uh, or your activities. But at least the driver is different. Sometimes the tools are similar and sometimes the communities you serve, you serve are also similar. But the motivations are very different. And for me, the main lesson was to be always consistent with what are our motivations, what are our drivers, what is our purpose, and what is our mission. And for me, that learning to be clear about those, you know, premises uh, has been essential. And being able also to explain them to the business um, and to have them understood. Great, thank you. We already have received uh, one question that has two parts. So one of them is directly uh, related to the practitioners and the other one is the DBPA team. So that we, we can't really escape that. Um, there is uh, a much touted change in the regulatory framework in terms of disclosure. And the question relates to the fact that uh, what is your initial thought? Yeah, on the longer run effects of the disclosure regulations uh, on the impact integrity aspects. Yeah. If I may start, is it okay with you, Aza, for start? Um, yeah, it's a complicated, uh, it's a complicated question. As I mentioned very rightfully so that, you know, the two worlds, the corporate world and the philanthropic world are kind of joining forces, getting closer to each other, working hand, hand in hand. Uh, I also, on another, on another side, I also command and applaud the fact that corporates are getting conscious of what their social impact is and their role and responsibility is in the social field. However, I think both worlds need to work closer together, but they need to remain distinct. There's, there, there, there's, there's, you know, the corporate world is so strong, so mainstream, so powerful that it can easily kind of be very invasive and take over other fields. So, and for me, that would be the wrong thing to do. Thinking that corporates can solve the social problems on their own, just because they are doing business in an uh, adequate and appropriate manner uh, is very generous, but I don't believe in this. And I think you have to have worlds, you have to have a world that is driven, uh, motivated, 
um, by by the by the social impact it needs to and corporate will still you know the business of business is to make business i forgot who said that there's a very famous sentence business of business is to make business in the end is to make profits so you can make profits in the most responsible way that that you can but still that's your driver whereas you know the philanthropic world is motivated the driver is disinterestedness which is not not being interested you are very interested in the fate of your beneficiaries but you're not interested in, in the financial sense of, 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 of the process if you mean if you understand if you um, if you will um so for me it's important to that this distinction is kept because otherwise thinking that the business and the corporate world will be the answer to the social problems of the world would be the wrong route to follow yeah i would say um esg it's only the beginning and we will see a lot of uh, things happening there and I think the S in the ESG will grow stronger and stronger. Maybe it's not uh, strong enough right now. So I do think that corporate roles will be uh, very different going forward when it comes to transparency and reporting, uh, which I applaud and I think it's a great development. I do think that uh, follow-up measurement, transparency is what we need. Uh, in the world and that we have a fantastic framework. We know where we're going with the sustainable development goals with all the indicators uh, also there. And I don't think anyone can solve anything of that uh, alone. And that's why, of course, goal number 17 is partnership. So I do think it's a lot about a multi-stakeholder partnership and new ways of doing uh, partnerships maybe not taking over each other roles but definitely finding ways where you not just work side by side but you're really working towards the same end goal uh, and i do think that is what we need to make the uh, the transitions that are needed for the coming decade thank you Asa. and uh, before i hand over to sophie for final remarks i would like to take an attempt to answer Katarina Papadi's uh, second half of the question. Uh, how do we take into account the disclosure regulatory framework uh, in, uh, on impact integrity and, and, and research, in our research? Uh, very shortly, our framework works independently of the context, but your um, understanding and your positioning will be de de depending on the context at the same time. So we're not really able to integrate context into the framework and into the tool, but the tool will work independently of context. That is something that each practitioner will have to take into account and we will have to uh, you know, understand where the dependence comes from. Sometimes dependence comes from actual regulatory framework. It's something that you can't really do uh, otherwise. Uh, but it, in this context, it's not really taken into account. So that is one drawback of the framework. However, it will work equally well in Western Europe as in Eastern Europe and other parts of the world. I hope that uh, is an answer that you're looking for. Thank you. So time to, to wrap up. Uh, quick closing remarks. So um, thank you so much, uh, all of you. Um, really um we i think we we clearly understood that um what is clear is it's not unclear um it's a fine line to to walk uh and it is it is a journey depending how the dependence on your your company is is uh, is moving on and uh, depending also also um what the strategic alignment journey is, because we all know that it's not static either. So the the good news is that yes, a close collaboration with your company is uh, is uh, very much uh, uh, needed and encouraged. And uh, the answer is yes, uh, there is uh, this risk is uh, completely uh, manageable. Um, as any type of risk, impact, integrity risk, just needs to be identified and managed, choosing the right medication actions. And uh, we saw through the, 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 the sessions that they were a full uh, tool of um, 
uh, full types of uh, mitigation action you can uh, you can play with. Uh, risk is not negative. No risk. Don't forget. Yes, we all know that. Uh, no risk. No innovation. No actions. It's just an indicator of CSI's uh, impact integrity. Um, and of course, the more you move towards more industry business alignment, the more you increase uh, the dependence. Huh? And it's up to each organization to choose the right mitigation actions, which best fits its need. So um, a matter of keeping this unstable balanced, walking this fine line, I'd like to say that uh, on top of the publication and the case study, very soon we'll have the assessment tool, assessment tool, which will allow you to assess your impact integrity uh, risk. And um, very happy to share that uh, our next uh, EVPA uh, corporate publication will be around how corporate social investing contribute to the s of social of esg strategy of the company so another focus on this interaction between uh, corporate foundation funds and and the company um, and now of course the impact integrity publication with uh, with resonates uh, a lot uh, for the one who do not uh, know us uh, yet uh, please see the link to our uh, website, uh, what the corporate initiative work is, how we support a uh, corporate uh, impact team with the strategy and um, uh, how we can help connect you with your peers to benchmark your initiative. A big thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you to our uh, inspiring speakers, Vincent and Azar. Warm thank you again. Thank you, EVPA team, and uh, to all participants. Uh, e see you soon, and uh, even better, see you soon in person uh, in some uh, events in Europe in the coming uh, weeks. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.